This podcast is not intended to provide any investment advice. The opinions expressed here by either the hosts or guests do not necessarily reflect the views of PSA, Collectors Holdings, or any of their affiliates. Any discussion of collectible values in the past or present is not a guarantee of future performance. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the PSA pod. Ryan Green, Jack Archer, and Steve Sloan coming to you once again from the NBA Jam studio here at PSA and Collectors HQ in Orange County. And we're back from the National. It's a dead time of year for sports fans, but we have a lot to cover and a lot of news, starting with our guy Juan Soto going to Southern California, San Diego Padres. Let's go. I'm so fired up. Not only are Juan Soto collectors fired up, but Tatis collectors are fired up. Mm-hmm. It's this is like the kind of baseball move you never see. We were we were talking about this before the show. Like you try to quantify this, young players of that caliber don't hit the market. Twenty three. Ever he's twenty three. Twenty three with one hundred and twenty career home runs already, a World Series ring, a career OBP over four hundred. Like the guy is a generational offensive talent. And I can't believe someone traded him. Like, no matter what you got in return, I cannot wrap my head around someone trading him. And that's what history will bear out, right? Yeah. As like, in terms of trading generational talents, it hardly ever works out. And so we'll see how kind history is to the Washington Nationals on this one. I mean, the man turned down a $400 million contract. At what point, like, the Nationals, what could they possibly do in that situation? I really respect Soto for being someone who wants to win and was willing to do whatever it took, including turning down $400 million Mm -hmm. to go to a place where he thought he could win. The Padres have a very loaded lineup. They get Tatis back soon. Tatis is already hitting BP, hitting bombs right now. They're going to be a dangerous team. They also had a Josh Hader as a new closer. He's one of my favorite pitchers to watch in baseball. If you're a Padres fan, there's a lot to like. If you're a Tatis collector, there's a lot to like. If you're a Soto collector, there's a lot to like, unless you are a diehard, diehard Dodgers fan <laughs> or, uh, you know, possibly a New York Mets fan. There is uh, it's 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 good for baseball. And I'm I'm super pumped and excited to see how it all plays out. Well, I mean, the Padres have always been the Dodgers kind of little brother. So the postseason matchup. Oh, oh I can't wait. They've please been, let it happen. They've been pretty, you know, they've been getting better and better every year between those teams. So I think. This is this year's must see TV. A lot of people wipe the COVID season of 2020 out from memory, but I, I think a lot of people with that forget how good that postseason series was when they met. And uh, I'm I'm really I mean they play this weekend, so I'm really hoping that it's just like a precursor of a really entertaining like five game NLDS just war. Yeah, it's, they they don't like each other. So. No, it's gonna be it's gonna be absolutely riveting. I I I can't wait. I'm 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 pumped. I'm really sad that I traded a Fernando Tatis card <laughs> for an Ichiro card at the National, because uh, I just feel like his stuff is really gonna pop off as soon as he's back and the playoffs start. But uh, got to do what you got to do sometimes. I wanted the card, and that was the only way to make it happen. We're gonna talk the National pickups here in a minute, because Jack, I think you, I, I can't wait for you to tell the story of this one. You got a, You got a big one, but let's let's talk about. You mentioned Tatis cards, this trade. Let's talk about the hobby effect. Because that's what we're here to do. Um, start with Juan Soto. What what's your initial take here for his hobby standing on the heels of this? Well, I, of course, I want to reserve judgment until after the postseason because that's where you're judged ultimately. Young guy, twenty three. You've been mentioned a couple of times. New Jersey, which is going to get a new fan base excited. Uh, you got anyone who listens to the pod knows I have a bit of a pet peeve about. Uh, players changing jerseys from the rookie card but you know for generational talents and a guy who's already won world series soto just has to play he just has to get on the diamond and and perform and i think the rest comes from there uh given his his incredible talent from a card perspective the population on juan soto cards is very 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 low compared Mm -hmm. to his contemporary peers uh he was in tops update meaning the refractors are numbered the x fractors are numbered uh even his uh retail only parallels like the pink uh the pink refractor which is generally pretty um pretty much considered an afterthought by by most Mm -hmm. ultra modern collectors uh goes for really crazy money soto cards are not easy to find right now 
and they're only going to get harder to find. And I think if you have a stash of Sotos at home, you're feeling pretty, pretty all right right now. I'm feeling pretty all right right now. That's uh no, it's you're right though, Jack. There's, he he was that per. We've talked about it on the show before. He's that perfect storm of ultra modern player where his his cards came out so late in the year. He has fewer out there. You mentioned the the inventory out there is low, especially raw. They're getting harder and harder to find. Yeah, and if you do find one, you just know there's a lot of question marks in terms totally. of uh, corners, edges, surface, yep. all that good stuff. On the Tatis side, I think people have forgot how fun this guy is. Oh yeah. There is nobody more fun to watch than Tatis when Tatis is in full Tatis mode. Uh, crazy athlete. He's just very contagious in his his mood and personality. He always just seems like he's having so much fun. The bat flips, uh, just how aggressive he he runs the base pass. There's there's a lot to like, and I think uh, uh, I believe him and Juan Soto are, are personal friends. Yes, I grew up together along with Vladdy Jr. Uh, in certain baseball circles. I think they're going to have a lot of fun. I think Juan Soto is incredibly relieved to be in the playoff hunt right now, and uh, just just really pumped to see this all uh, see this all play out. Tatis has to stay healthy, though. Yes. Uh, I know I'm going ESPN talking head guy right now, but Soto's going to totally block out his son, so to speak, uh, if he can't stay on the field. And it'd be such a shame from a hobby perspective because we've had two guys who've had parallel paths have really been ascending, but Tatis just keeps kind of tripping up because of the health issues. Mm -hmm. Now's an opportunity to pair him with another young, great superstar, and it could be uh, just incredible for collectors of both of the guys if they can both stay healthy. Tatis talking to you mostly there. I mean, in fairness, my guy got hurt. I, I believe it was like a motorcycle accident yeah. or he's dirt biking or something. Yeah. And how is that better? <laughs> it's, <laughs> at least it wasn't better? on the field. <laughs> yeah, it's better than like ripping your hamstring in half. Like, the routine ground ball to shortstop yeah. or, or what have you. The but other it brings thing, in the judgment uh, yeah. questions a little bit. He's but young, that's old guy kid. over here. Uh, Fearless. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he lives uh, on the edge. Yeah. No, just the My way man. that Soto antagonizes pitchers and Tatis, yeah. you know, has the flair. This is going to be a really fun combo. It's I just can't be. wait for the dual card. And they're so young. Yeah. They're both so young. Yeah. I, uh, I really can't wait. The Padres had to give up some big prospects. Mm -hmm. They probably had the best uh, farm system to unload. But what's really interesting about this is that if uh, whether or not they win a ring this year, they have Soto for next year. And if things aren't working in their favor or Soto has no indication that he wants to re-up and, and sign long term there, they can move him for even more prospects. Yep. So there's a lot of opportunity and flexibility for the San Diego franchise right now. Uh, C.J. Abrams, really fun speedster. Um, there are some parallels to Trey Turner, mm -hmm. who was also traded from the Padres to the Nationals, developed by the Nationals, became a you know multi-time MVP candidate, multi-time All-Star, one of the most fun and exciting, smoothest players in the game. Mm -hmm. So I, I really like him uh, in a Nationals uniform. I think it's going to be fun to, to have a playoff. And then your guy, Hassel, yep. was also part of the deal along with McKenzie Gore, uh, one of their, their flamethrowers. And, J and uh, James Wood, who is one of the prize pieces in 2022 Bowman, uh, if you rip that product. This is where it's kind of a reminder, too. If you're in the baseball prospecting corner of the hobby, it is, it is not for the weak of stomach because you, you get into guys, and just like that, they can find themselves uh, in another organization's kind of developmental pipeline. But, you know, th this can also work in your favor, too. Um, you mentioned the big names. Those are the top four prospects in the Padres organization with a, a, a deep org, uh, farm system with a really good major league club. When they get flipped over to a team where there's a total teardown and rebuild happening, maybe there's a faster pipeline to getting to the majors. So it could it could work in your favor, but you can never take for granted that they're going to be in that same developmental system all the way up to the show. So James Wood is exciting. Mm -hmm. The dude is six seven. He yeah. kind of has that O'Neill Cruz, mm -hmm. Aaron Judge potential. Um, I'm I'm a big fan of like very oversized or very undersized baseball players. If you're just average. You know, that's okay. But if you're like extremely tall or extremely short, I want to watch you play baseball. <laughs> All right. So, Jack, you mentioned giving up a uh, Tatis that now in hindsight, you you wish maybe you hadn't, but you had a pretty darn good return. So let's transition because we just got back from Atlantic City. We want to talk about the National. Let's start with the pickups. What'd you, what, what did you pick up? 
I picked up a few things. I was in a lot of meetings. Uh, my tongue felt like it was going to fall off at the end of every single day. But in between, I was able to kind of scan the showroom floor, do some grinding, do some trades. I brought a few cards that I uh, I really like, but I wasn't necessarily in love with, mm -hmm. um, whether it's aesthetically or kind of how they fit into my collection. Just stuff that felt like a little a little off and uh was able to move some things i i traded the aforementioned tatis it was a bowman chrome x which is the green x fractors the collab they did with stock x number to 31 psa 10 rookie i moved that for a ichiro pool holes dual tops traded rookie card from 01 one of my favorite cards the gold parallel version in a psa 9 so i was very stoked about that sweet card picked up uh, a few more herberts uh and i the biggest trade i did the biggest trade i've ever made for the biggest card i've ever owned and something I'm incredibly excited about because it's a card that I love. It's a card that really combines sport and style and art together in a really exciting way. I was able to move a handful of cards into the 1985 Nike promo, Michael Jordan in a PSA 10. Incredible card. Oversized, beautiful imagery that just calls to the 80s in terms of the, the nice jump man. I can't wait to see this, thing in, see this thing in person. It's an extremely low pop too. It's very, very hard to get that in a 10. It was the perfect storm. Of, I was actually meeting with someone. He's in like the media podcasting business. He was feeling like a little, feeling like his collection was a little bit stale. Kind of wanted to move away from the goats and have more fun in the hobby again with prospecting, uh, specifically with, with Justin Herbert, who I have a lot of Justin Herbert cards, uh, a few of them that are very nice. And uh, he had this Nike promo and he was like, I'm, willing to let it go for a fair price and i want some justin herbert so let's make a deal and uh we were able to make it work so i'm incredibly excited to have this one it's it's the first card i've, I've ever owned that really does feel like, like a family heirloom in a little bit um it's just it's a beautiful card the oversized slab presents really well and it's definitely something i'm going to hang on to for a very 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 long time I, I think my reply to you when you showed it to me i was like that's a legitimate asset like you said like the family heirloom line that's one of those cards where you see it and I, I feel I'm just going to assume you get that and you can just imagine yourself passing that down generation to generation. Yeah, there are various like fractional ownership applications out there. Rally being one of the, the biggest ones. They were kind of first on the board and uh, they offer that card fractionally. Yeah. So to own something that other people own that want something so bad that they're willing to buy a fraction cool. of it. Yeah, it's pretty it's pretty unreal. And it's a it's a really big step for me as a collector to get something like that for a true goat in my collection. I, I couldn't be more thrilled. I think you touched on something too that I saw happen more so this national than past national, and that's trading. Mm. So it seemed to be a really high level of trading, you know, throwing some cash if it wasn't a you know, a, a pure card trade. But we saw that outside the convention hall and spillover yeah. events in, in terms of trade nights and things like that. But uh, seem to be occurring at a high frequency. Everywhere I looked, people were making trades and, and uh, rejecting or accepting. Yeah, it was fantastic. I remember, so my flight was delayed on the way in Wednesday, and I show up at like 10 p.m. to the hotel. The hotel was right across from the venue. And I was like so bummed because I wanted to see everybody. I wanted to check out the show for the Wednesday night like VIP thing that they have. And I was so sad that I missed it. Sitting on the airplane, you know, trying to connect to the poor Wi-Fi, just being like disappointed I wasn't there. Second, I walk into the hotel room. There's like 150 people in our hotel lobby, just just pelican cases open, grinding, making trades, networking. And I was like, I'm home. This is great. Mm -hmm. These are my people. Uh, and it was it was really nice to have that. But we saw that throughout the whole week. Such an appetite, just just insatiable appetite yeah. for, for for activity, for seeing cards, for understanding what the other guy had, making offers. It was it was really cool. When I could actually get up to a table because there's so much foot traffic, yeah, I feel there's points of the show, especially earlier in the show, where I just couldn't get to the dealer showcases because there's just too many people checking out, talking to dealers, make, making trades and offers. But um, what I did is I picked up a couple 1977 Star Wars number one Luke Skywalker cards. I actually picked up two, one for each daughter, and I put them into the collector's vault, which is the official vault of PSA. I was con I was uh, determined to get a couple items into the vault from the show and not have to take it home. And um, it was a really pretty seamless process, but it just seemed like a nice way to make a purchase at the show, put it in the vault, go home, no worries. Those were those were pretty sweet pickups too. And again, it's a card I've always wanted. It's one of those cards that down. it's just part of uh, mainstream culture at this mm -hmm. point. And 
my my kids are really into Star Wars, so I figured that would be a good thing to to tuck away for a couple years uh, for them. You're right. That it is really cool how easy how how willing everyone was to trade. Right, like Jack mentioned it. You know, work wise, we had a lot going on last week. So I know for for all of us, uh, you know, it was no different for me. You know, it was so busy that the time to actually go peruse the show floor and maybe try to make deals was limited. But in that limited time, was able to find a way to you know make a couple trades, pick up a nice new Justin Fields slab, um, and just kind of acquire some stuff. But there was a lot of cards moving in both directions, and you love to see that. Yeah, I would say you were busy capturing all the content around the hits coming through. Oh my PSA. god. It was like, I'll, I'll just call it like a hit parade. Like you it couldn't was, stop yeah. getting updates about what's the next coolest car the PSA graded at the show. You know, one of my when I started working here, it was a couple months after I was talking to one of my friends who collects, and he was like asking me about what the coolest part about working here was, and I said, "Dude, like the, the stuff that comes through here every day, you just wouldn't believe, right?" And you know, I've I've worked here ten months, and I've gotten to hold two T two hundred six Honus Wagners in my hand. I love telling people that, but like. At the national, it was that like times ten. Like it felt like every five minutes there was something coming through our operation that they were like, "You got to see this. You got to see this. You got to see this." Like, just, just another reason to follow mon- PSA card on Twitter and yeah. Instagram and all those places. But monsters, like we couldn't even capture them all. It was which is just crazy. But I mean, there were definitely some that stood out. Like, okay, hold- let's all right, let's let's run through the list. You got to start at the top. I think yeah, from based on what. The- the big fish, like yeah, holding, yeah. I held the fra- the Mike Trout 2009 Bowman Chrome Super Fractor Auto in hand. It crossed over. Finally um, where it belongs. Yeah, from PSA a competitor holder. slab, it, it crossed over to a dual grade 910 PSA slab. And I mean, the the photo we have on social and like the video like looks really nice. And like, you, I can't even underst- like overstate like how cool that card is in hand. If that thing hit golden tomorrow. It's $5 million card. You think five million? I think I think five. I think it's more. You think so? Yeah, it's one of one, man. Yeah, yeah. It's. I mean, it was it sold for three nine? Three point nine four, I believe, in two thousand nineteen or twenty. Um, it was it was recent, but yeah, I mean, it's in a PSA slab. We know what that can do for value now, and and I mean, the hype over iconic one of ones like that, like. There's so many Mike Trout cards out there, you know, as there should be. I mean, the guy's been an icon of the game and the hobby for a decade. And to sit there looking at this thing saying, I'm holding the single best Mike card, Mike Trout card in existence in my hand. Like that was unquestionably the greatest Trout card. Yeah. It looks, it really does. You hit on it earlier. It looks outstanding in mm-hmm. the PSA case. With it the does. red border and everything. It just, it feels right. It did. I don't know how many we grade at the show, but I feel the same way about the star cards. You know, yeah. Like the red from the card and the red on the PSA label, like there's just certain it matches perfect. combinations that just work. And, and that's one of them there. Yeah, there was so there were there were some heaters. That was a big one. Um, And, you know, we saw the first card we graded at the show. The very first card to come through was the Michael Jordan masterpiece from 1997 Fleer Ultra, which had never surfaced publicly before a 25 year old mega grail that no one had ever had ever seen showed up raw that's what the national is about people don't like always shipping car yeah i mean it's it's a great place if if you live locally yeah for security reasons you just want to walk it right up to the booth that's Mm -hmm. that's what shows bring out uh just those types of cards Uh, my favorite was 1956 tops mickey mantle which was crossed over from another company's nine i believe to Mm -hmm. a psa nine which is just an iconic card Outside of the 52 tops, uh, probably the most popular tops issue for Mickey Mantle. Um, incredible card and one that just is like, it's a it's a grail as well, just to yeah. hold in your hand. Just like, wow, this is this is uh, vintage Mantle and this is what it's all about to be a, a, a true vintage card collector. I, uh, I, I also, you know, want to point out that there were a lot of modern, like ultra modern and modern grails that came through that were just as stunning. Like, uh, you know, the, Trevor Lawrence, one of one contenders auto of uh, the throwback 2001 design came through. That was a stunner. Lots of stuff from Flawless. We can debate it, but I think T Law was like the biggest name going around every the show. table. Every, I mean, people are hyped for for him this every year. Table. I think just the change in, in coach and everything else. Um, it's like the the rebirth of T Law is getting a second chance off the rookie year to to go, and people are, are buying in. Yeah, his stuff has gotten much 
pricier than I was expecting based on how his like mosaics and like first release stuff was, mm -hmm. was selling for compared to other quarterbacks, especially Mac Jones. Uh, I didn't see a lot of Justin Fields out there mm -hmm. or Trey Lance. Uh, you know, you were talking to either a dealer or a fellow collector while you're out there about like the people are just sort of in wait and see mode for a lot of these quarterbacks. Yeah. They're excited for the football season. And, uh, you know, if they're willing to pay a premium for Trevor Lawrence, you can have them. But otherwise, like, let's just see how this thing plays they're out. Wait and see. Because there's a lot of talent with uh, the last year's draft class and a lot of unknowns uh, with, with a bunch of teams going into this season. I'll, I'll say this, what dealer, a couple dealers told me about Justin Fields made me feel better about all the Justin Fields cards I've hoarded, where they were like, well, his stuff is still really cheap. Everybody's kind of holding the wait and see. Nobody's, nobody really wants to sell too low on it. So I'm like, all right, I'm in the right position. There, yeah. There was a lot of Jalen Hurts hype at the show, and yeah. I was like so confused at first. And then I was like, wait a second, we're like an hour away from, from Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. We have these, you know hardcore Eagles fans that are that are true believers and going crazy for Jalen Hurts but his stuff was popping uh John Morant stuff and Anthony Edwards was really hot on the showroom floor mm -hmm. uh previously it was like you know Luca Mahomes but it really felt more like Burrow Herbert John Morant Anthony Edwards like those were the the people everybody was after I think baseball felt kind of slow but I also think it was sort of in like the dog days of the baseball season so that makes sense. Uh, but football, football was hyped up. I cannot tell you how many times I saw this a gorgeous gold prism card thinking it was Jamar Chase and I get a little bit closer and it's T Higgins. <laughs> I probably did that 75 different times. Yeah, we did see a, a pretty good uh, Jamar Chase come through. Wasn't the downtown one of one? The downtown through? gold vinyl one yeah. of one came through. And we also got a call out. Jack called it before the show. The uh, a dual logo man, an iconic dual logo man that showed up raw again. Showed up raw, had never been graded before. Yeah, it was Kevin Durant, Kobe Bryant, dual logo man, dual auto, but really beautiful, bold autos on the card. Vertical on card, yeah. Yeah, it's on the it's on the PSA card Instagram, so make sure to check it out. I, I was just like in awe of, of how beautiful that one was. And it's, like you said, 2007, it was Durant rookie year paired with Kobe. It's really tough to top that. There was There were just so many crazy cards coming through. Yeah. I love it. I think overall for... I think there's a lot of uh, flack about AC, but inside the convention center, I think you guys recognize this and can probably speak to it, but like just the evolution of the industry, like Jack, mm -hmm. what did you think about the fact that the, the, the corporate row in particular just felt like it was yeah. a little more extravagant this year? The jump from the national last year to the national this year was 10 X, 20 X in terms of production value, the booth, designs the amount of money that was being spent to make this experience so much more special and unique was really impressive uh shout out whatnot for some fantastic design elements shout out zero cool they use this really cool agency called camp grizzly up in portland to do their uh their uh what do they call it the, the zero tron which is this giant cube that they would do like live q a's on they had like a really beautiful seating area they were doing some just fantastic things in terms of like sort of like uh, zagging away from some of the more like traditional elements and, and just trying something new and uh, opening up the hobby to ultimately be more inclusive, which is I, something I think we all want. And speaking of just how everything felt a little bit different, I saw I saw some some new dealers that primarily deal in ultra modern have a lot of vintage stuff. I even saw one particular dealer who is a like a very hardcore vintage enthusiast have some joe burrow cards like some national treasure stuff like flawless stuff like nice joe Bur nice joe burrow cards along with everything else and i was asking him about it and he was like i just can't help it i really like the kid like i'm, I'm i haven't bought like that. modern cards until now but like i've got some and i thought that was really cool and the more that we can open up this world this hobby that we all love to as many people as possible whether it's non-sports like what zero cube is doing with stranger things and dune which is one of my all-time favorite books and i cannot wait for that card set uh or just making the industry sort of like less judgmental like if you like vintage hockey it's okay to also like modern football or yeah. whatever it might be and just sort of being interested in everything uh even if your passion is a specific thing to sort of appreciate everything i i felt like that was was much closer uh, at this national 
It's interesting that you you said that about like the production value and the you know the the activations such as I the, I, I come back to the zero cool and, and Stranger Things announcement that they'll be making uh, Stranger Things product here coming up pretty soon. You know, I always try to think of this from like the perspective of of a customer, right? And I think of it from my own situation. Like if I brought my girlfriend, for example, to a local card show with me where it's just rows and rows of dealer tables and I'm just talking cards and looking at cards with people all day. She's going to get bored really fast. Like she'll go with me because she'll, she would go. But she, like, you know, I'm sure after like 30 minutes, she'll be like checking her watch and just be like, all right, are you done? Like, but thinking about it from the national, like I feel like there was stuff there that even if you are not really into the hobby per se and there to deal, like there is so much there to keep you engaged. And you know, like the straight- giveaways, custom yes, cards, like, spin wheels, holograms of Logan Paul doing 360s. Yeah, and, they've yeah. turned it into like a legitimate experience to where I think just about anyone there and Jack hit it on the head with the term. It's it's more more inclusive um, that you can find something there that's going to appeal to literally just about anyone. You can be three feet away from Joe Montana breaking a box of cards. That was cool. You know, the stuff yeah, like that, yeah. I just like, I think really is pushing us into a really positive direction. and it's good i think i think because i think as we move forward with this show you're just going to see everyone continue to to level up because you kind of have to and i think you know things like that it's, are just great for the hobby at large we haven't talked about the collector's uh booth in terms of the cards that were on display the 1952 tops mickey mantle and psa 10 from ken kendrick's collection was i think a big hit in terms of the fact that people were just blown away by the idea of the valuation of that card has it mm-hmm. obviously sold in decades but in a 10 being worth 25 to 30 million got a lot of people taking photos with the card like this is a museum moment essentially and then also logan paul's illustrator uh PSA which is a 10 yeah. psa 10 the pop one card uh that was inside with the, the pendant that it came on so i saw a lot of people kind of acting as if they were wearing it so like you say, just a lot of variety, like the grail cards being on display for people to see. Like there's very few places where you can see this high level of, of cardboard and it's usually only at the national. And so once again, that delivered. So if you came to booth 2030, the collector's booth, think about all the different things we talk about all encompassing and all inclusive. Think about all the different things you saw there, you know, for the traditional collector card collector, you know, we had the Ken Kendrick collection headlined by that mantle, which was just a showstopper for anyone walking by the booth. You had the introduction of Funko Pop grading, which is coming soon to PSA. And we had the Funko Pop display. You had the WADA activation with that incredible showcase with Madden, graded Madden games from every single year. I was, I couldn't believe how many people like were, were, I'm so happy so many people got drawn to that. You had the Pikachu Illustrator, PSA 10. It was awesome watching security every morning, laying out the chain perfectly around the Mm -hmm. cart. Like all of these things were a great way for collectors as a brand. This was our first really big trade show where it, within the sports collecting hobby industry where we were able to show the marriage of all these brands under the one banner, literally on the sign at the top. And it's just like kind of a taste of what's to come under this this banner for years to come. The WADA setup was incredible. Mm-hmm. It was really cool seeing like it was like a it was like a museum moment, like a like yes. a history timeline of Madden throughout the years. It brought back so many great memories. And, uh, it honestly, I was searching eBay for like, I was like, how can I recreate this in a way that's like a little more affordable? Yeah. Looking at Tiger Woods games, like all that stuff. So it got me, it got me really hyped. I, I just dabble in video game collecting. I've, I have like a nice collection, but my obsession level isn't quite where it is with cards, but seeing stuff like that makes me get really, really hyped to advance my collection some more. Well, okay. So what's next? Uh, after the national there's a lot for the hobby to focus on and turn to what are you looking at ryan i think what i'm most looking forward to coming off of the national i was really excited you know i I mentioned it in this last segment but seeing all of the collector's brands i'm going to sound like a company man here but i am um seeing all the brands under the collector's banner you're starting to see how it's all coming together and working together as one and with the launch of the collector's vault publicly last week and people learning more about it at the show last week and my collection tool on collectors.com and the collectors app, which is now live uh, on Android and in the app store. Um, You know, I think you, I'm really curious to see, and I'm excited to see where all this goes in the next six months for kind of helping collectors bring everything under one umbrella and into one, like just into one stream. 
So, you know, playing with the My Collection tool, you can do it at collectors.com right now. Like, it's super clean. It's in beta right now, but it's super clean, and you can totally see where this is headed. Um, I think it's very exciting. And, you know, Steve, you mentioned you ingested a couple cards into the vault from the National, you know, for your daughters that you wanted to store there. You know, I've never, I'll be totally honest, I've never vaulted cards before. I'm going to start doing it because I want to kind of test it out and 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 see what that process is like, and and I'm pretty sure I'll be all in on it. Um, and I think a lot more collectors are going to like me who have been longtime collectors who like having their stuff in hand, um, you know, are probably going to start trending in that direction too. Yeah. Watch out once the, once the liquidity component is, is actually attached to it. Um, it's just kind of peace of mind, you know, being able to have your cards imaged for free, stored for free, secure, all that fun stuff. And hopefully once the liquidity element is is tied in, uh, through golden, uh, we'll be able to see quick market opportunities come to life, uh, especially for like the, the mid to even somewhat low end cards where a guy has a great performance on the field and you want to act. Uh, maybe he's not someone you PC or something like that. And you see an opportunity to capitalize on and you, and you, and you flip it at that point. So yeah, a lot of things are coming together. I think the biggest thing for me coming out of the show is that just watching people make the realization that there's connection between PSA and the collector's vault. And that those two things are one in, of the same in terms of uh, ownership and, and process flow. So, Big thing for me is just the overall momentum. If you came into the national thinking like, oh, the market's a little bit down. Oh, like the economic conditions like might, you know, put a damper on this. You didn't feel that way. It was all left at the door. All left at the door. Everybody was so excited to be there. Everybody truly loves this hobby and they love trading cards. And just the amount of, just the amount of infrastructure being built around this thing that we love that desperately needs technology like we're building was really, really cool. And then to see other companies kind of like be there with us, building with us, it just felt bigger and better than ever before. And it's just getting started. There's going to be a time that national, it it feels like San Diego Comic-Con, if not bigger. It's going to tie to sports in a a huge way. And it's going to be really, really exciting to see. And I'm excited to be here on the ground floor. And on top of that, football season. It got me that much more excited because we've talked about it in recent weeks. Um, how the national was going to be a real jumping off point. And I think it just was confirmed there. You saw all the the football product moving uh, in both directions across dealer tables. Um, I think the football card market is basically about set to explode. Scott Hansen, this is your invitation. Come on the pod. Let's talk cards. (laughs) Yeah, I'd say just to kind of follow up on what Jack said there, like if you didn't walk out of the national with this huge burst of energy, then you were a zombie throughout the whole thing. That place was just amazing for community. And I would encourage anyone who's in the hobby, if you didn't get a chance to go to the national, try to find a way to connect to your community of card collectors face to face in real life, go to your hobby shop, go to a local card show, whatever it takes to, to just get that engagement. It just changes everything. It does. We know social media can be toxic at times and, and, and that's not what the national was at all. It was like a, just abundance of positivity and that's because people were interacting face to face doing trades talking hobby talking shop and and that's what it should be about yep and uh i i know i left felt feeling energized uh both as a collector and just for the overall state of the hobby and now i can't wait for the rest of the year football is almost here and we're gonna be back next week and we're gonna talk football 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 watch out everyone because like ryan is a football addict so it's about to get real with i cannot wait Next week, we will be back. We'll be talking football now that the training camps are open and the buzz is going. I can't wait. I'm like jumping out of the seat. You guys can see it. For uh, Jack Archer and Steve Sloan, I'm Ryan Green. We'll be back next week once again here on the PSA pod.